Yeah, welcome everybody to our uh, second uh, lecture in this course, European Macroeconomics. Last week we talked about the general objectives of macroeconomic policy. And uh, today I want to present you two key macroeconomic models uh, that um, are the prominent models in, in all, all macroeconomic textbooks. And as I said, these models play an enormous role in, in macroeconomic thinking, and therefore it's important to understand them, to understand their mechanics. And this is exactly what I want to do today. Um, we have a very tough program today, I must say, so because I would like to show you both theories this afternoon. And uh, so let's, let's try how we get through it. Um, okay, let's start. Everything is recorded and all the technical details you know already, so I go, go on. And as I said, I want to present you the mechanics of the two core macroeconomic models. And what, what is really important to have in mind is that whenever we talk about economics, uh, we always have a model in mind. We are not always aware that, that we have a model in mind, but we always have it. And so this is an insight that was already uh, made by John Maynard Keynes uh, many years ago, and he said, uh, practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influences are usually the slaves of some defunct economists. So economic models shape our thinking, and therefore it's important to know these models, to know the mechanics of the models, and also to know the policy implications of these models. And that's exactly what we want to do today. And um, first of all, let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, what do we understand with models. And in my view, models are a way to reduce a very complex reality to some relatively simple structures. You can also say a model is a narrative. It's a way to make a complex development simple, understandable. Um, and that's, that's why we need models, because the reality is so complex and models help us to deal with the complexity of reality. And in this regard, models can also be compared to maps. Um, I've shown here two, <laughs> two different uh, maps. Both show Berlin. And uh, what you can see from these maps, they all reduce the complexity of reality. The map on the left side definitely uh, has a very small scale, so you only need to see the major uh, autobahns and, and highways leading to Berlin. Um, so a lot of reality is not shown in this map. The map on the uh, right-hand side shows you the details of, of, of Berlin. You can see the streets, but of course, it does also not show all what's really happening uh, in Berlin. It doesn't show you the concrete buildings. It does not show you, um, it does not show you what kind of buildings uh, you have here in this, in this, in this map. So, what is important with models, they reduce complex, complex uh, reality to a relatively simple structure. And the important thing is if a model does not present everything from, from reality, if it abstracts from reality, this is not a fault of a model. This is exactly what, what, what is the main benefit of a model that it reduces complexity. Um, and so, and then the question, is it a good, is a model good or bad? Uh, depends really on what you want to do with the model. Uh, the model, the map on the left hand side is a very good map if you drive by car and you want, want to find a way how to make it into the uh, city of Berlin, um, while uh, the map on the right hand side is the right map if you arrive in Berlin at the, at the main station, if you want to go to Berlin Linden or to the, to the Friedrichstraße, so it depends on what you want to achieve with the model, whether a model is useful or not. And so it's not about bad or true models, it's really uh, on the purpose that you want to uh, achieve uh, with the model. And while this reduction of complexity is important, um, while omitting many elements of reality is important to make the structure simple, uh, a problem with model or of a model arises if it shows uh, landscapes uh, which which are fantasy landscapes 
uh, and he pretends to show reality. I think there you have to be really careful because somehow uh, economists also have a tendency to develop models of fantasy landscapes and um, pretend that this uh, fantasy landscape uh, represents reality and then you have a problem. Yeah, this is the landscape of Middle Earth, uh, Lord of the Rings from Tolkien and it's an interesting landscape. But of course, it doesn't help you to find your way. I already said this, uh, macroeconomics uses two models. And the interesting thing is that these two models are completely different. Both are useful, both might be used to understand reality, but these two models are completely different. And one of the key problems of macroeconomics is that very often it's not made explicit how different these models are. And these two key models is on the one hand, the classical or neoclassical model, on the other hand, the Keynesian model. And I will show you uh, these models in detail. We will go through these models to understand how they, how they work. But uh, it's important just when we start with these models to make it clear from the very outset, what are the main differences between the models? And the main and probably most important difference between the models, between the classical against the models, the way how they present the economy. And the classical model presents an economy which is by itself stable, self-stabilizing. So it does not really need uh, politicians to interfere with uh, this economy because more or less it's self-stabilizing. And the Keynesian model is just the opposite. It presents an economy which has inherent instabilities. And these instabilities require uh, stabilization by economic policy. So this is a, really the main core difference between the two models. And why are these models so different? Well, it depends uh, on the way of how they are designed. And the model design of the classical model is extremely simple. There's only one good, only one good in this whole economy. So the model tries to describe our reality of today with just one uh, good. You can say it's a kind of all-purpose good, and this good can be used for consumption, for investment, and also as a financial asset. And this is the decisive design feature of the classical model. The Keynesian model is closer to reality, I would say, because it differentiates, it has different goods. It has consumption good, investment good, and it has also money, and it also has bonds. So the design is, is different, and the different differences in the design explain also the different functionalities. The financial system in the classical model is more or less irrelevant. It's a veil. The financial system in the Keynesian model plays a decisive role. And I would say that in most textbooks, this is made more or less explicit. In most textbooks, it's also said that these models are different, but uh, there is a trick used to make these models compatible. In the standard textbook, they tell you the classical model is for the long term when prices are flexible. The Keynesian model is for the short term when prices are inflexible. So the idea is also these models are so different. They both describe reality. One model describes reality in the, in the long term and the other model describes reality in the short term. But this trick is really, is really uh, useful, uh, this trick really helps to make the two models compatible is something that we will discuss in more detail. These two model worlds can also be described in a somewhat different way. And I think a very useful description is by Josef Schumpeter, an Austrian economist who lived in the early 20th century. And Schumpeter made the differentiation between the two models uh, he says the classical model is, in his, his words, a real analysis. The Keynesian model, in his words, is a monetary analysis. 
And how does he explain it? He says, yes, the classical model proceeds from the principle that all essential phenomena of economic life are capable of being described in terms of goods and services, of decisions about them and of relation between them. So all can be described in terms of goods and services. Money, the financial system, is not needed. And here Schumpeter goes on saying here, money enters the picture only in the modest role of a technical, oh, sorry, of a technical device that has been adopted in order to facilitate transactions. It does not, money does not affect the economic process, which behaves in the same way as it would in a bot economy. This is essentially what the concept of neutral money implies. So that's the classical model is a model for a barter economy, because you have only this one good, what else can you do uh, with this model? The Keynesian model, or what Schumpeter calls the monetary analysis, in the words of Schumpeter, says this model introduces money on the very ground floor of our analytical structure and abandons the idea that all essential features of economic life can be represented by a bad economy. So just the opposite. It's not a bad economy. It's money. Money changes the world, so to say. And uh, Schumpeter says then money prices, money incomes, and saving and investment decisions acquire a life and an importance of their own. And it has to be recognized that essential features of the capitalist process may depend upon the veil and that the face behind is incomplete uh, without it. So I think that's a very nice characterization of these two worlds. The classical world with the one good uh, design is a world that assumes that all processes in the model, modern world can be described by a body economy. And the Keynesian model uh, is a model where money plays a decisive role. And money is not just the coins or the banknotes that we have. Money is a whole financial system. It's banks, it's central bank, it's the capital markets that are really decisive for the functioning of our economies. And uh, I think that's what defines what, what describes these two model worlds. And um, from this uh, basic uh, introduction now, I think we can now go into the details of this world and we start with a classical model. And it's, it's a model for a wheat or corn economy. That's why we have chosen uh, this, this picture. Uh, so if you really want to understand uh, the functioning of the classical model is really the best way to have in mind this kind of corn economy. And we will go in more detail uh, uh, in, this, in this world. So the key assumption of the model, I already said this, uh, is this kind of all purpose good that can be eaten, which means consumed, it can be invested, and it can also be borrowed, so it can be used as a financial asset. And that's a very peculiar assumption if you really want to describe our reality of today. But normally it's not discussed uh, in economic textbooks, uh, whether this is really a useful way to describe our economies. And it's interesting if you look in uh, textbooks by really leading economists, how they talk about it. So one textbook by Robert Barrow and Xavier Sala y Martin says, one way to think about the one sector technology is an analogy to farm animals, which can be eaten or used as inputs to produce more farm animals. The literature on economic growth has used more inventive examples like such terms as smooth, putty or ectoplasm to reflect the easy transmutation of capital goods into consumables and vice versa. Interesting. Huh? So that's, that's how modern textbooks talk about uh, the way how this classical model is designed. I also want to quote uh, uh, Obstfeld and Rogoff, uh, 
uh, which is a famous textbook on or textbook on international economics, um, and they say the unit of capital is created from a unit of the consumption good. This process is reversible, and so that a unit of capital, after having been used to produce output, can be eaten. You may find these assumptions unrealistic, but they help us sidestep some technical issues that aren't really central. So it's hard to believe that uh, with such assumptions, leading economists pretend uh, that they have a model which can describe what's going on today. But anyhow, one has to be aware of this, this assumption because only if one is fully aware of it, one can understand how the model functions. So how does this model function? And uh, last week, I said that macroeconomics is always about the equilibrium between aggregate demand and aggregate supply. Like the microeconomic model is about the equilibrium of the demand and the supply for specific good. Um, so whenever we talk about macroeconomics, it's important to ask ourselves, how is aggregate demand determined? and how is aggregate supply determined? Then of course the question is how can aggregate demand and aggregate supply be equilibrated because the idea is always that the, that the plans to, for, that the plans to demand something and the plans to supply something are, are made independently. And the question is how can these independently made plans be made compatible? And that's something uh, that we want uh, to describe now. So in the classical model, um, how are aggregate de demand and aggregate supply determined? And um, well, we have to ask what is aggregate demand for the all-purpose good? Uh, we assume there is consumption demand and investment demand for the all-purpose good. Um, and um, aggregate supply, we assume that the aggregate supply is determined by the available amount of labor and capital. Capital here is the all-purpose good from the previous period uh, planted uh, in, the, in, this, in the ground and producing uh, then the output. Okay, let's think about aggregate demand first. And if you have only one all-purpose good for a consumer, the only decision is, will I eat or consume the uh, all-purpose good today or tomorrow? That's the only decision a consumer can take. So normally, when we have microeconomics, a uh, consumer asks himself, will I uh, consume good A or B? Will I drink uh, beer or wine, coffee or tea, um, pasta or, or uh, chicken? Um, so it's always about the decision, uh, the intratemporal uh, decision, which of two goods will I consume? But if you have only one good, of course, the consumer can only decide, will I consume uh, the all-purpose good today or tomorrow? And um, what determines this consumption decision between consumption today and consumption tomorrow? Well, it is determined by my preferences for consumption today and consumption tomorrow. Normally, people have a preference for consumption today. So if I'm thirsty and it's, it's a hot day and I ask, will I drink a glass of beer today or a glass of beer tomorrow? Normally I will say, let's, have the, let's drink the beer tomorrow, today uh, and let's see what we will do tomorrow. So there's also preference to consume uh, goods today and um, this, this preference is, 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 is reflected that normally a certain amount of a good today uh, is uh, regarded as, um, so for, for, for a certain amount of good today, if you want to substitute it in goods tomorrow, we want more of the good tomorrow if we are willing to give up one unit of, of the good today. So, uh, the preferences for consumption today and tomorrow matter. And uh, now this model assumes that you can always 
uh, borrow uh, or, or lend uh, the all-purpose good. So if you want to, want to consume today, you always and you do not have this this all-purpose good, you can borrow it. And therefore, the question is then: if you want to borrow it, what is the price that you have to pay if you want to borrow this this consumption good? Or the other way, if you decide not to consume to, to good today. If you lend it, what is the price that you get if you do not consume the good today? And therefore, the second important determinant of this intertemporal consumption decision is the real interest rate. So if I, as a household, want to save the good, not to consume it, what do I get if I, if I lend it to an investor? Um, and this interest rate that I get from the investor, I compare with my preferences for consumption today and for consumption tomorrow. Let us look at a simple example. So we have Sue, and she's indifferent between 100 units of the all-purpose good today and 105 units of the all-purpose good tomorrow. The question is now, how does she decide? Does she consume today or does she consume tomorrow? And this decision is now made according to the real interest rate. So if Sue saves 100 units today and the real interest rate that she, that she can get from investors for uh, lending to them is 4%, she knows she will have 104 units tomorrow. And, that, and she says, well, 104 units tomorrow, this is not sufficient to give up consumption today. And therefore, see, she consumes today. On the other hand, if the real interest rate that investors want to pay is 6%, then of course she will get 106 units tomorrow. And this is for her more valuable than the 100 uh, goods today. And then she will not consume, she will save the all purpose good and hand it over to the investor. And so, in a very simplified way, um, sorry, in a very simplified way, um, we can say that consumption today is determined by the real interest rate. The higher the real interest rate, the more likely it is that people will not consume today. And the lower the real interest rate, the more people are willing to consume today. In other words, they are, they are not saving, they are consuming. And so the real interest rate is a key determinant of the consumption decision. So we have a negatively sloped consumption fun function for consumption today, relatively easy. So the same thing now we can do for the investment demand. We already said that if the households do not want to consume the all-purpose good, uh, they lend it to investors. So there must be investors who borrow it. And so the investment decision is now kind of mirror image of the, save, of, the, of the saving decision. So the investor now asks himself, if I take the, if I, if I borrow uh, the all-purpose good, um, and if I invest it, if I take the corn, uh, and, and if I, if I saw, saw it, uh, saw it, saw it, yeah. If I take the good, and if I saw it, uh, how many more units of the good will I, will I have tomorrow? So this is, so to say, the return of investment, so to say, the production function uh, of, of, this, of this investment decision. I take a certain amount of the old purpose good, I saw it, and then what do I get out of it uh, tomorrow? So this, is the, this is the return of the investment. And then, of course, I have to ask myself as an investor, if I have to borrow uh, the old purpose good from the household, uh, how many units of the all-purpose good have, do I have to give the household back tomorrow um, if, he wants, if he wants to be repaid uh, for lending me the all-purpose good? So the investment decision is determined on the one hand again by the real interest rate and by the return of investment. Again, let us try an example. If uh, Jim plants 100 units of corn today, uh, it will bring him a harvest of 106 units tomorrow. This is a return of investment. 
And then the real interest rate, let's assume it's 5%. So then he has to pay 105 units corn to the saver through tomorrow for borrowing 100 units from her today. And of course, then he'll borrow. Because his return will be six units and he has to pay five units interest. So it's obviously profitable for him to do this. On the other hand, if the interest, real interest rate goes to 107, um, then of course uh, it should be if the real interest rate goes to 7%, uh, we have to correct this, uh, then Jim will not invest. So then again, let's have a very simplified way of, um, of presenting the investment function of this, uh, of this classic economy. So the idea is then the higher the real interest rate, the less people will invest, the lower the real interest rate, the more people will invest. So we have now in a very simplified way, of course, we have the consumption function. Consumption today depends on the real interest rate. The higher the, uh, the real interest rate, the less will be consumed today. And we have the investment function in a kind of similar way. The higher the real interest rate, the less will be invested, the lower the real interest rate, the more will be invested. And now what we can do, we can add up consumption demand and investment demand to, uh, to get the aggregate demand of this classical economy. So here we have first our investment demand. And if we, and then we have the consumption demand. And now we can add up investment demand and consumption demand in a, in a horizontal way to get the aggregate uh, demand of our economy. And we can see this aggregate demand depends on the real interest rate. Very simple, I hope. Are there any questions so in the meantime? No? So far, no questions. So far, no questions. Okay. I think it's relatively simple. Of course, we simplify a lot. I must admit you can uh, present all this in a much more complicated way, much more complex way. But I think for general understanding of the model, this is definitely enough. It's what matters is to understand the decisive role of the real interest rate for consumption demand and for investment demand, and then also for aggregate demand. So now we have aggregate demand. The question is now what determines aggregate supply? And in the classical model, um, aggregate supply is determined by the labor force and the capital stock. The capital stock is now to be understood as the amount of the all-purpose good invested one period before. Because the amount of the all-purpose good invested plus the labor give the output of the current period. I think that's very important. So capital, normally you think of machines and everything, but in the classical model, it's just the all-purpose good from the previous period that has been used for investment purposes. And that's what we have seen from these quotes uh, of, of um, Barrow and, and, uh, and uh, Rogoff and others. Capital is, is not a machine, what you might think, when you hear the term capital is just the all-purpose good used as investment good. Yeah? And so the, the aggregate supply is determined by the decisions made a, a period before. Um, and, um, and of course, it's determined by the amount of labor and by the amount of the all-purpose good invested. And um, these are the inputs for the for, for aggregate supply. And what you get from these inputs in terms of output, again, in terms of the all-purpose good, is determined by the production function. The production function describes the relationship between inputs and outputs. And typically uh, in, in the classical model, and I think most simple macroeconomic models, uh, the aggregate um, production, production function looks like this. Um, and it is, it is uh, it, it, you can describe it by what we call diminishing, diminishing returns of scale, which means, um, and, and here the aggregate uh, production function is now, is, describes now output um, in 
uh, depending on the amount of people that are employed. And that's how, how we describe uh, the, the equity supply. We assume that the capital stock is constant. And um, so the, the aggregate uh, production function shows this relationship between out employment and output, assuming that capital is constant. And the diminishing returns, which explain the shape of the production function, assume that the output of each additional worker gets smaller the more people are employed. And that's, that's the logic. Uh, so it's, it's a, a diminishing uh, in terms of scale and why, why, what explains this assumption? Well, um, one can explain it with the fact that these models were developed um, for an agricultural economy, for agriculture, and you can uh, imagine if, if you have, if you're um, in agriculture, if you have more people working on, on, on a field, of course, each additional worker has some positive effect on, on output, but of course, the more workers are uh, employed on the same field, then the additional uh, effect of this uh, worker on output gets, gets smaller and smaller. And maybe if you have too many people working on a field, then maybe the output, even the additional output can become negative. So, but that explains the shape of this production function. And so um, in the classical model, output is, uh, determined by this production function. And as the model assumes full employment that all people are uh, find a job, want to, want to uh, work, um, with this model, you can then easily take, take the amount of employment. You, you then see on the production function, what is the output that is produced? And you can see now, easy, can now show easily for this uh, classical model, uh, for full employment, what is the aggregate supply? Huh? So that's, and, and what is important now, this aggregate supply only depends on the production function, on the technology, on the capital that has been invested a period ago, and on the amount of labor. It does not depend, that's important, does not depend on the real interest rate. And that now allows us to combine aggregate demand and aggregate supply in this, in this model. Um, we have here our aggregate demand and we have now uh, for simplicity assumed uh, that it's a linear uh, function. So we do not have this king uh, function that we've just, just used before. So we assume a similar linear, linear slope uh, for this, um, uh, for, for aggregate demand, we have here our aggregate supply, and we have here the real interest rate where aggregate supply and aggregate demand are in equilibrium. And now what we can, uh, what, we, what we can now try to find out is what happens if we have a demand shock? For instance, if households have a lower preference for consumption today, what happens uh, in this model? And uh, well, we get a downward shift of the aggregate uh, demand. And now we see um, that at the constant real interest rate, um, there's no longer full employment. So aggregate demand is no longer in equilibrium with aggregate supply. We have excess supply. And what happens now? What is the way how this system is self-stabilizing. I said at the beginning, the fascinating feature of the classical model is that it is self-stabilizing. And what can now help to stabilize the model? Well, um, so we have here this excess supply and um, how can we, uh, can we now get uh, back to equilibrium? Well, the real interest rate has to fall. Uh, and and why does it fall? Well, we have excess supply of the uh, all-purpose goods. So uh, consumers want uh, to, to offer more of this uh, all-purpose good than investors want to borrow. And by offering more of this all-purpose good, uh, the interest rate, which is the price for the all-purpose good, the intertemporal price for the all-purpose all-purpose good, the interest rate declines, and then 
get here a new equilibrium. So we can see in this model, uh, self-stabilization depends on the real interest rate, which is a stabilizer whenever there's a short real interest rate, it goes up or down, and it helps to stabilize uh, the system so that we don't have a problem uh, with this uh, unemployment. So full employment is always guaranteed. Well, this is the first important insight for this, for this model. Self-stabilizing real interest rate is the key variable um, that prevents um, unemployment. And therefore, there's also no need for the government to interfere uh, with, this, with this economic system. So we have two questions. Um, yes. One question on the production function. Uh, why is capital constant in the production function? It's just, it's just a way to simplify it. Um, and of course, you could, can also have capital stock variable, but in order to show the impact uh, on, of employment on output, normally we assume that capital stock is constant. And then a second question also on the production function. Um, you just said that the production function does not depend on the real interest rate, only on labor and capital. Yeah. But does not that capital invested into the production process depend on the interest rate? Would that not mean that the production function in fact depends indirectly on the interest rate? This is true, so there's kind of indirect effect, but normally the way how we present it is that we just assume that what's happened in the, uh, the period before is, is just uh, determined and it has no, so the interest rate can no more have an effect on these decisions that were taken uh, in the previous period, but you're right, over time, definitely this would be the way how also the real interest rate uh, determines uh, supply side of the economy. But normally this is really neglected. Okay, now we can try to look at the model from a kind of different perspective. And that is the perspective that is normally taken when textbooks talk about this model. I must say, describing the model from the perspective of aggregate demand and supply is not the usual way of how it is presented. But I think it's important to do that um, because then also helps better to understand the other perspective. Normally, this model is presented from the perspective of saving and uh, investment. And we have been talking about consumption that depends on the real interest rate. And in this model, the consumption decision is identical with the saving decision because the consumer asks him or herself, I have a certain amount of this all purpose good, how much of it will I consume? And if the amount is given, the decision to consume is identical with the decision to save the rest of the all purpose good. And saving means in this model, that you use the all-purpose good to operate uh, on the capital market so that it can be then uh, borrowed by, by investors. And so the saving decision is the same thing as investment decision. It's just, it's just, it's just a mirror image. And um, yeah, you can see it here in, in our chart um, where we have the, the income, um, and now um, you can say, well, if, if you have a very low, um, if you have a very low um, uh, interest rate, um, then all the output is consumed, nothing is saved. And on the other hand, if the real interest rate gets very high, everything is saved, nothing is, uh, nothing is consumed. So, these two functions, the consumption function and the saving function are just mirror images. Uh, and, but normally this is not mentioned in, in, in models. So people just normally present it just as the, uh, as, as, a, as a saving function. And of course, as the consumption depends on the real interest rate, uh, of course, saving also depends on the opposite sign on the real interest rate. And this allows us now to present the model in a different way. And that's the way how it is normally presented. Uh, you can present now this model which just describes the good groups market, saving and investment. Now it is presented as a model for the capital market. 
because now you have our investment function that is the same. And now you have the consumption function represented as a saving function. And now you have a model where you have saving investment and you have here the real interest rate. And then the textbook says, the standard textbook says, this is our capital market. This is a market for loanable funds, as well, sometimes also said. Um, and here we can see that the real interest rate is determining uh, what's happening on the capital market, it determines the saving, which is then not presented as the mirror image of consumption. It's now presented in the class, in the standard textbook as a supply of funds. Uh, an investment is described as a demand for funds. Well, that's a very, very interesting way to present a model for a goods for a one good market, aggregate agri demand, aggregate supply for one good market. It is now suddenly presented as a model for the capital market. And um, you can look in almost all modern textbooks. Uh, that's you can find you can find this chart, and they say it's the financial market, but also, it was maybe a little bit difficult to go this to go to the uh, consumption function and the investment function, but it's also not that complicated. You can see what is what is genuinely a market for this all-purpose good, a market for a kind of barter uh, economy, intertemporal barter economy, is suddenly transformed and presented as a market. For, uh, for funds as a financial market. And it's really astonishing that in, in, in textbooks of the 21st century, you get this chart presented as a chart that says, this is how our modern financial markets are working. This is really, really, really surprising. So, um, what, what you have, to, what the takeaway is now in this classical model, the so-called financial market is in principle, a market for, um, for this, for this all-purpose good. It's, it's a kind of financial market is, 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 is in reality a goods market. And what is really important here is that the real sphere is identical with the so-called financial sphere. This is not a financial sphere. It's a so-called financial sphere. Yeah? And so this so-called financial sphere is this model that you can see here in the chart uh, is not a veil over the real sphere. It's just the backside of the same coin. And I think that's, that's really an important takeaway that in this model, there are no financial decisions. There's only the decision to consume, which is the same thing as a decision to invest. Uh, sorry, there's only the decision to, to consume, which is the same thing like the decision to save. And there's on the other hand, the, the investment decision. So with a consumption decision, investment decision cannot describe the financial market. I think that's important insight. So, I've presented you this, this classical view, and you might ask, is it really, is this really a way how today economists are thinking? Because we started the quote from Keynes that somehow uh, the ideas of, of economists shape our thinking uh, on economics, on economic policies. Is this really a realistic way uh, how, uh, how people think? Isn't it, isn't, isn't it that really a little bit strange? But you can see famous economists like Larry Summers, uh, who was US finance minister, he was chair of the uh, US uh, Council of Economic Advisors. Uh, he said in 2016, just as the price of wheat adjusts to the balance of supply and the demand for wheat, it's natural to suppose that interest rate, the price of money, just to balance supply of savings and the demand for investment in the economy. This is exactly 
uh, what what I what I what I said. Um, and, and the interesting thing here is a little bit, and I think that's important. He talks here of the price of money. Yeah, but our chart here, this real interest rate, is not the price of money. This is the intertemporal price for the all-purpose commodity. It's it's not a price of money. It's it's an intertemporal price of of, for the for the uh, all-purpose good, but this is what economists then mix up. And then, of course, uh, Summer says excess savings tend to drive interest rates down. And excess investment tends to drive them up. So the classical view really plays a role, and is this view also leads to the conclusion that the interest rate is a non-monetary phenomenon. It's, it's it's not it's not determined. Uh, by the central bank is not determined by banks, um, and uh, you can, can see it here in uh, in statements by Philip Lane. He's the chief economist of the ECB, and he is uh, reflecting, like many others, on the causes for the decline of interest rates from the 1980s until today. And um, he says there has been a trend decline in the underlying equilibrium in real interest rates since the 1980s. Uh, the equilibrium real interest rates is the rate required to match the desired labels, levels of saving and investment. Again, and then uh, how does he explain it? This decline in interest rates, he says, the combination of slower population growth, rising life expectancy, and an aging population acts through multiple channels to push up desired savings and reduce desired investment. So fully in line with this, with this model. And uh, then he says the reduction in desired investment also affects reflects slower productivity growth and possibly shifts in, in the structure of the aggregate production function. And he concludes in the wake of the global financial crisis, risk appetite may also have diminished which provides a disincentive to invest, reinforces the precautionary saving motive and encourages a portfolio shift to less risky assets such as sovereign bond. So here again, you see really how this simple model, this goods model, so to say, this commodity model, how it shapes the thinking of uh, economists on, uh, uh, on interest rates and also on, on monetary phenomena. Okay. So let's uh, sum it up. What are the key features of the classical model? Well, its mechanics are determined by the assumption of the all-purpose good. If households do not consume the all-purpose good as consumption good, this good can be directly used as investment good. Saving is therefore the source for the funds needed for investment and by not consuming uh, the all-purpose good, households make it available for investment. So saving is required for investment because only if the households do not eat this good, it can be used for investment. If they eat it up, it cannot be invested. Therefore, house saving is the precondition for investment. Um, the interest rate can, mechanism can always equilibrate aggregate demand and supply. And then the goods market can then present it as the capital market. Um, and the all-purpose good, which is transferred from households to investors, is then regarded as capital or loanable funds. The interest rate, and that's important, is a real or commodity interest rate. It's not a money interest rate. It is the price for consuming today and not tomorrow, and it is expressed in units of the all-purpose good. And the important thing, the financial market is not a veil over the goods markets, Rather, the two markets are like two sides of the same coin, and the financial market in this model is really only a so-called financial market. Okay, let's have a break. So I think we come back in about five minutes, so we can drink a coffee or relax a little bit, and uh, then in the second part, we talk about the Keynesian model. Thank so you. welcome back after the break. Um, I think we have some questions or one question. Yeah, we have uh, one question. Uh, could you repeat again how interest rates are determined or relate to aggregate demand in the classical model? Yeah, 
can do this, going back to this one. I think for this, in, um, to, to understand this, I think we can use uh, this, uh, this chart here. Um, so we have saving, and here we can say this is the supply of the all-purpose good. We have investment, which is a demand for the all-purpose good. Okay. And now if um, people decide to save more, we get a shift of the, of the saving schedule. Um, the increased supply of the all-purpose good reduces the real interest rate because now savers are supplying this uh, all-purpose good. Uh, and in order uh, with the, with the, with the constant demand uh, for, for investment, the price for the all-purpose good has to fall and the real interest rate is the price for this, for this all-purpose good, for using it today. I think that's, that's the important thing, that it's the price for using it today. And if consumers do not want to use it today, the price for using it today falls so that then investors will say, okay, we will use it. Yeah. Okay. Maybe so one, one thing that I would like to mention is uh, we have to be, be, be very careful with the real interest rate. And this is a term which can be used in completely different ways. In the context of the classical model, the real interest rate is a kind of commodity interest rate. Surprise for this all purpose good today, tomorrow relative to the price for the, yeah, it's a price for, it's a price for using uh, the all purpose good tomorrow relative to using it today. So it's a consum it's, it's, a, it's a commodity price. What we'll see now when we talk about the Keynesian model, the interest rate is a price for money for using money today, not for using all purpose good. And so in the Keynesian model, we'll talk about this in detail, the interest rate is always a money interest rate. So we have a commodity interest rate in the classical model and a money interest rate in the Keynesian model. What we often do is that we use the term real interest rate for a money interest rate minus the inflation rate. That's the standard way how we use the term real interest rate. So if you have the nominal interest rate of let's say 2%, if we have an inflation rate of 1%, then the so-called real interest rate is 1%. But that's always a money interest rate. And a lot of confusion is created by the fact that the classical model only derives a real interest rate, not a money interest rate. And this real interest rate is a commodity interest rate. And what we often call a real interest rate is a money interest rate deflated by deflated by uh, uh, the uh, price deflated by the inflation rate. Yeah. Okay. So let's go to the Keynesian model. And this is a model where money matters. I think that's the key inside. Money is not in the we'll talk about this also a little bit more in, de in detail. In the classical model, money is useless. You don't need it. If only one commodity that can only be traded intertemporally. So why do you need money? Yeah, so money is absolutely useless in this model. In the Keynesian model, money plays a decisive role. And um, so when we talk about models, it's important to see how they are designed because the functioning of the models depends on their design. And the Keynesian model is designed in a different way. And that really starts with the, uh, with the assets that uh, are used in, in the model. Uh, and while the classical model has only this one purpose commodity, uh, the Keynesian model has more assets. It has consumption goods, investment goods, money, and bonds. And what really matters for the Keynesian model, you cannot use consumption goods as an investment good. I think that's, that's the key difference. And of course, this is what we will see then. Uh, this, is, this is creating 
also the inherent instability. If people decide uh, to buy less TVs, these TVs cannot be used as an input uh, for the production process for producing other, uh, other goods. Uh, they're simply uh, standing around, they, they, uh, the, they're standing around the shops and they do not know, know uh, it's a kind of involuntary uh, stocks that are built up uh, and they cannot be used. And of course, that makes a huge difference if the products that consumers do not want to buy are just idle, nobody wants them, this creates a problem. If these products can be used as an investment input, it's wonderful. And so this is a very simple but very decisive difference between the two, two models and it of course has an enormous uh, effect on how these models work, on how uh, these on, on the mechanics of, of this model. So in the case of the model, we have four assets, consumption good, investment good, money and bonds, um, and they are, they are different. They cannot be transformed into each other. So from this, we can directly see a key difference um, of the Keynesian model and the difference concerns saving. In the classical model, saving means that the all-purpose good is made available for investment. How wonderful. But what happens in the Keynesian model when the consumption good cannot be used as investment input? So let's look here at an example. Mrs. Smith, Smith decides to save. She had the idea to buy a new watch for a thousand euro. But well, due to COVID, the labor market situation is worsening and she decides to save the thousand euros instead. Say, well, do not need you watch uh, so much. And I, I just decide not out of my income, we assume that Mrs. Smith has an income and, and she decides out of my income, I do not decide to buy this watch, I just save the money on my bank account. Now we can ask, is this really something positive? Is this something which reduces interest rates? Is this something which induces investment? Not really. Huh? So if you look on the goods market, the reduced demand for watches leads to an involuntary stock piling at the retailer and to a lower demand for, uh, for companies producing watches. So definitely not something stimulating for, for more investment. So what about the financial system? The decision of Mrs. Smith to save means she has a thousand euros more on her bank account. But it's always important in economics and macroeconomics to look at the other side, like in bookkeeping. It's not enough just to look at what happens to one side uh, of the market. What does this imply if these thousand euros are not spent on your watch? What does it imply for the retailer? Well, it implies that he had, has thousand euros less on his bank account. And if you add that up, the bank account of Mrs. Smith and the bank account of the retailer, uh, in aggregate, there are no more, no more funds available in the economic system. It's just a different distribution of funds in the, in the economic system. So it's not like in the uh, classical model that more funds are available that create downward pressure on interest rates. It's just a different distribution of the same amount of funds. And so you can immediately see there's no reason, direct reason why interest rates should go down. And so I think one can show <laughs> this is a very simple example, the key difference already between the two models. And these Differences matter because the automatic decline of the interest rate, in the classical model, which helps to re-establish the equilibrium between aggregate demand, supply and demand, it is not there. The there's no reason in the Keynesian model 
there's no reason for the interest rate rate because it's the same amount of funds in the economic system. Why should uh, interest rates decline? So here we can uh, make this comparison once again. I just said that. Um, so saving in the classical world means lower demand for the all-purpose good, but which then can be directly offered on the capital market as capital and used as investment good. It means an increased supply of financial funds, which reduce the interest rate. In the Keynesian world, uh, the lower demand for the consumption good just leads to involuntary stockpiling on retailers. And the direct impact is here in the classical world is the interest rate decline and the interest rate decline re-establishes equilibrium between demand and supply. And um, in the Keynesian model, the, re the higher stockpiling uh, of the retailer means uh, it's a reduced demand for the producers of the consumption good. And on the financial market, there is no effect at all because the amount of funds remains the same. And here we have in the classical model, the stabilization by the interest rate mechanism that restores equilibrium on the goods market, or if you want to call it also on the financial markets. And in the Keynesian world, there is no automatic stabilizer for the goods market, just a declining in demand. So, with this very simple example, I think we have already understood the key insight of the Keynesian model and the key difference between the two models. But let's have a more closer look at the Keynesian model. And um, again, it's the question of how can aggregate demand and aggregate supply be equilibrated. And uh, here in the Keynesian model, which has a short-term focus, D, uh, we have to differentiate between long-term supply and short-term supply. And uh, on the one, one hand, and then we have aggregate demand. And um, the, on the supply side, long-term supply in the Keynesian model is more or less identical to the aggregate supply in the classical model. Short-term supply, that's what really matters, is determined by aggregate demand. So the Keynesian model is very much demand determined. The aggregate demand plays the dominant role in the Keynesian model. And uh, what are the elements of aggregate demand? Well, this is relatively the same as in the classical model. It's consumption and investment, but consumption is now determined in a different way than in the uh, classical model. So the key assumption of the Keynesian model is this uh, demand determination of short-term supply. And this is something which in the COVID crisis you can uh, very uh, often uh, observe. Uh, so in, in this COVID crisis, we had lockdowns, um, we had all kinds of, of, of uh, regulations and restrictions. And uh, you could see that, of course, several sectors of the economy uh, was, was, was a strong decline in aggregate demand. And what you can then observe is that this uh, decline in aggregate demand was very, very, lead to a very almost simultaneous reduction in production. And here for Germany, you can see how the exports, Germany is a very export oriented country, how the exports declined uh, in this first lockdown in spring uh, 2020. And you can see the almost immediate reduction of production. And then again, when the export situation improved, it's kind of V-shaped recovery. You can see also how production very closely followed uh, the, the demand. So the idea that short-term uh, uh, production, short-term supply is determined by demand is I think, a very realistic assumption. Uh, if you look at, at how, how, the, uh, how uh, production is now organized uh, in, in, in our economies, uh, it's really this kind of just-in-time production so that really the companies try to follow with their production very closely uh, to, to demand. And so I think that's a very good description of, of, really of, of our reality. So 
in, in, in the Keynesian model, the assumption is that short-term aggregate uh, supply is, is really determined by, by short-term uh, 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 demand. And this assumption, which is a key assumption of the model, the demand determination of short-term aggregate supply um, is shown here by this 45 degree line, um, which is the short-term aggregate supply in the, in the Keynesian model. Here we have aggregate supply and aggregate demand. And the idea is if I have an aggregate demand of eight, um, it leads to an aggregate supply of eight. So this is a key, key assumption of the model, and um, it's important to understand this 45 degree line in this way. You can look at other textbooks, you can read all kinds of confusing things about this 45 degree line. It's amazing in, in leading textbooks that the authors obviously do not understand it, uh, and, and it creates so much confusion uh, for students because supply and demand are the key uh, uh, pillars for macroeconomics, and if I present a macroeconomic model and I'm not able to identify that this 45 degree line is short in the supply, it's confusing from the very beginning. But really, take a, have a look, look in other textbooks. It's amazing how much nonsense really prominent economists write on this 45 degree line. And it's so easy. You just have to ask what determines aggregate supply in the short term, well, it's the demand. And that's, of course, the brandmark of the Keynesian model, this de demand determination of supply. So we have already short and aggregate supply uh, in our Keynesian model. And um, what is what about long term uh, aggregate supply? Well, we assume, like in the, like in the classical model, that Long-term aggregate supply is determined with the production function using capital and labor in the same way as we have already described it for, for the classical model. And um, we have here just a kind of vertical line. We have here our uh, aggregate, aggregate supply. Uh, and we assume, of course, it's a little bit also arbitrarily, but we assume that the long-term aggregate supply is not determined. By, uh, by aggregate demand, which is, of course, simplification. Um, but as I said, models do not 100% capture reality. And in order to show the mechanisms of an economy, for instance, in a situation of a COVID crisis, I think we can work with this assumption. Of course, in a more realistic uh, uh, presentation, of course, aggregate long-term aggregate supply determines on, on aggregate demand. But here, as a simplification, it just assumes this. So we have already uh, the supply side of our, of our model. Let's talk about demand side. And aggregate demand in a modern economy is uh, composed of private consumption, government consumption, investment, changes, changes in inventories, and the so-called external balance, which is the difference between exports uh, minus uh, minus imports, and um, oh, in order to keep it simple, uh, we just uh, leave it with consumption investment as we did in the classical model. So we only ask what determines uh, investment and consumption. One short remark um, on the um, components of equity demand. I think in all economies, private consumption is the main uh, component of uh, aggregate demand. It's, it's more than 50%. It depends. Some countries, aggregate demand, uh, in some countries, private consumption uh, is, has a very large share uh, of aggregate demand. For instance, in the United States, about 70%. In other countries in China, it's only about 35%. So. <laughs> They are huge inter-country differences, but nevertheless, in all countries, private consumption is a main component of equity demand, then followed very often by, by government consumption here. Government consumption is uh, mainly 
the wages of people working in the government sector. So this is uh, in the statistics, this is government consumption. So government consumption is not the parties uh, in, in ministries or so, it's really, most of it is really uh, payments to people working in the, uh, in, the public, in the public sector. Okay, but we will concentrate to keep it simple on private consumption and uh, on, on private investment. And so we asked what determines private consumption in the Keynesian model. And here we see another key difference. Uh, consumption today in the classical model is only determined by the real interest rate. And in the Keynesian model, in a simple way, at least simple presentation of the model, we assume that consumption is only determined by, uh, the, by the current income. Um, so the consumption decision is only determined but how much people earn. Um, and um, the real interest rate in this symbol model does not play a role uh, for, for consumption, the, the Keynesian model. So consumption is determined by, by the current income. And we assume that the current income is generated in the production process. So we assume that all the supply that is created in uh, in the process is uh, turned into income of, of households. Um, and so, uh, yeah, aggregate supply is identical with the income that, that the households generate. So we do not differentiate between profits and, and, and wages. So we assume it's all, all, all uh, the value added that is created leads to income of the households. And we assume now that uh, the, the consumption is determined by, by the income. And we assume that households do not spend all the income. They save a certain part of it. Um, and a certain percentage is saved. Uh, and of course, uh, it also means that, 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 the, that the difference between that, that what is not saved is, is consumed. And so B, is so-called marginal propensity to consume. So that is the percentage of income which is consumed and not saved. And A is assume is a kind of auto autonomous consumption, uh, which means that even if people have no income at all, they need to consume. Um, and so this is a kind of a constant. And um, yeah, so we have relatively simple consumption function. The consumption depends on this autonomous component and on the income and a certain percentage of the income is consumed um, while the rest uh, is, is, is safe. And so this leads to our Keynesian consumption function, which is linear. Um, here we have the autonomous consumption. And uh, for simplicity, this is not a realistic value. I have to tell you, uh, we assume that this B is 0 0.5. So sim simple, nice, linear function, which is our consumption function. And um, okay, so far, now we have to say something about investment and, and saving. Um, as I already said, saving of the private households is income minus consumption. So the saving function is a mirror image of the consumption function. And if um, we have the consumption function C, equals a plus uh, b times y, uh, we can uh, derive a saving function, which is then uh, minus a plus one minus b uh, times y. So this is saving in our model, mirror image of consumption and investment uh, for the matter of simplicity, we now assume it's a constant. We will, in the following uh, lectures, uh, discuss saving that depends on the interest rate as it does in the classical model. So um, we have saving and investment uh, in the Keynesian model. And um, we, the model assumes that only household save, firms do not save, so there are no profits uh, in, the, in the corporate sector. All the profits are distributed uh, to the the households. So this is not in line with reality, we have to say where firms save a lot and saving of the firms 
is is more or less identical with the profits uh, of the firms. But here the model only households serve safe firms do not save. So now we can go one step further. Um, now we can um, derive aggregate demand. And for aggregate demand, we take our consumption function and we have to add investment. Investment we assume is a constant. And so adding up investment to consumption gives us aggregate demand, which is composed of consumption and investment. So, and now we are close uh, to presenting the equilibrium in this Keynesian model. Um, we have our short-term aggregate supply here. And then we take our aggregate demand. Oops, wait a second. We take our aggregate demand here. And if the intersection of aggregate demand and aggregate supply gives us our equilibrium. Yeah. So by combining the aggregate demand function with the short-term aggregate supply function, we get um, our equilibrium of aggregate demand and supply. And we have now chosen uh, the data in a way that here we have a full employment uh, equilibrium. Great. So this is the Keynesian model. Now we have to show what happens in this model if we have a um, if we have a negative demand shock. What happens? Just just one question. Yes. Um, please. Could you please explain what short-term aggregate supply and long-term? So what are the time spans of short-term and long-term uh, supply? This is a good question. Um, so normally this is not not. Uh, made explicit. So I would say in short term is a period like we have it right now if you look at this COVID crisis. So short term I would say is 2020, 2021. Yeah? And while we still have a kind of aggregate supply, which means all that we talked about the production potential um, last week, which is more or less identical uh, with this um, the aggregate supply. And I think now we had these shocks this year, last year, but we still have the aggregate supply as it was built up, established before COVID. Yeah? And of course, as time passes by, uh, one will have to find out, do we need all these hotels? Do we need all these restaurants? Do we need so many uh, airports? Do we need so many planes? There will be an adjustment. Yeah? And so once this adjustment is made, then the short term becomes, we get a new long term. Yeah? And maybe that helps a little bit. But it's important to, to make this distinction because normally when, when, when textbooks present this Keynesian model, they do not talk about this kind of uh, long term supply. They do not show what is really the full employment uh, uh, supply in the economy. But you need it as an anchor to understand what happens if the economy is confronted with a shock. And that's what we do now. Because now we are in equilibrium. Now let's assume we have a demand shock. For instance, something like, 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 a, um, like, like a housing boom bubble that crashes. People have been investing quite, quite a lot many years and now suddenly they realize oh we have too many houses and investment declines and um, here again so we have our that's where we start our, our our equilibrium and we here we assume our investment has a value of two now comes the shock investment declines from two to one and that shifts our aggregate demand downwards. And now that's the logic of the model. The lower aggregate demand also lowers aggregate supply. So we get here a new equilibrium. And uh, here we are. <laughs> and, and now if, if with eight we had full employment, 
obviously with six, um, all the people that you need to employ to create full employment, there are not all these people are longer are, are needed. So you need less workers for this lower output, and so we have unemployment. So this is now the very basic um, presentation of the, of the Keynesian approach. You have this demand shock. The demand shock needs to a new short-term equilibrium between accurate supply and accurate demand. And it is an equilibrium with unemployment. And now the question is, are there any equilibrating forces in the system? How can we get out of this situation? How, how can we get back from six to eight? How can we um, find a way to, to increase output back to the, to the full employment level? And in this very sim simple presentation, there is so far no automatic stabilizer in the system because we have just this supply that just contracts. People just produce less. And now, the supply of goods is in line uh, with the reduced demand for this. Nothing happens. And this is, I think, the key insight from the Keynesian model that if the economy is confronted with a major negative demand shock, you get a new short term equilibrium on the goods market, but it's an equilibrium with unemployment. And there are no direct, no automatic forces that lead back to the, um, to the full employment equilibrium because as we have said, um, if uh, households decide to save, this does not create an additional supply of funds that reduce interest rate, it just shifts the funds, the, the, the available amount of money from companies to households. And this is also not something that stimulates uh, the investment by the companies if they have less money on their bank accounts. So there is also from the financial side, no automatic stabilizer. So this is, so to say, the key difference uh, between the classical uh, view and uh, the Keynesian view. Uh, so the classic economists, classical economists believe that the that supply always creates a sufficient demand. That's the so-called sales law going back to Jean-Baptiste Say, a very famous French economist. Uh, and the Keynesian um, view of the world is a different one. It says, this is not true. Supply cannot always create uh, its own demand. And we can try to look at this uh, again using our, using our uh, chart. So now we have this, this short-term equilibrium, short equilibrium on the goods market. And um, so let's assume that um, the companies believe in Mr. Say, in Say's law and say, whenever we produce something, um, our supply will create us a sufficient demand if they believe in it. So let's assume that the producers say, okay, let's reproduce, reproduce uh, an output of eight. We produce a full employment output because as uh, this famous Baptist state says, uh, supply always creates its own demand. But what happens if we have a uh, supply of eight? As I said, the supply is always identical with the income that, that people receive in this, in this model. So what happens with the supply of aid? Well, the green line is consumption. Yeah, so with the um, supply of aid, um, we have consumption of six. And we have investment of one unit, which makes seven. So aggregate demand is seven, but aggregate supply is eight. What is the key 
problem in this economy? Well, you see, in this uh, situation where uh, the, the companies say, okay, we produce the full employment output because we assume it will create its own demand. You see here, saving is two units, while investment is only one unit. We see here, we have a disequilibrium between saving and investment. Saving plans in this situation are higher than investment plans. And in the classical model, that would be no problem because then uh, the saving would come to the capital market, reducing the interest rate and more investment would be generated. In the Keynesian model, where the saving is television sets that cannot be, be used as an input for investment, uh, it's just uh, a stockpiling, which, which has a negative impact on the consumers. And so you see here in this example, the problem in the Keynesian model that saving is not something that you can use for investment. In the classical model would be no problem. Saving would reduce interest rate. And so uh, what is really important uh, is that the role of saving in the two models is completely different. And, and uh, from Keynes, you have this uh, nice quote uh, in his general theory that he says, an act of individual saving means, so to speak, a decision not to have a dinner today. But it does not necessitate a decision to have a dinner or to buy a pair of boots a week hence or a year hence, or to consume any specified thing at any specified day. Thus, that's important thing, the decision to save depresses the business of preparing today's dinner without stimulating the business of making ready for some future act of consumption. Saving, says Keynes, is not a substitution of future consumption demand for present consumption demand. It is a net diminution of such demand. So saving in the Keynesian model is always something that has a negative effect on aggregate demand without having any positive effect, just reduces today's uh, aggregate demand. And it, it says nothing about what's going to happen uh, with aggregate demand tomorrow. I think that's, that's a key insight. And that explains why saving in this model only has a negative effect, but one has to add, and Keynes didn't say that. The key difference to the classic model is that it's said that consumption goods and investment goods are different goods in the Keynes model and are identical goods in the classic model, because that is what really makes a key difference. Yeah? And unfortunately, Keynes also has not made this so explicit. So you can have a look in James Keynes book, General Theory, but it's very difficult to read. And it has led to a lot of confusion uh, because yeah, it's, 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 it's in my view, it's, it's not a well-written book. Uh, it's not a textbook that helps you to understand uh, what's going on. I think you can read the book once you know how uh, these uh, models work, how you have understood the mechanics of the two uh, model worlds. Then when you then read the Keynesian book, you say, oh, that's what he means and that's what he means there. But he is, in my view, uh, somebody who is really confusing to read, uh, but nevertheless, have a look inside, try to understand it. But if you don't understand it, you should not be frustrated. And that's really important. Well, and so I think the, the role of saving the classical model, we have already described it at length. So it's the, the key factor is that this saving means that the all purpose good is not consumed. And as it is not consumed, it becomes available as an investment. Good, wonderful. Saving is, is a great thing because it frees up uh, funds that can be used for investment. So, so it's, it's really a, it's an extremely positive thing. And of course, if people try to save more, as, as we said, interest rates decline, lower interest rates make it more attractive for, for, for companies to invest. And if more investment is made, the economy grows and everything is fine. So isn't that fascinating to see these two model worlds contrasted, to see how different they are and to see how easy it is to understand why they are so different. 
Uh, it's, it's not a very complex uh, uh, reflection required to understand why there's a different just, it's just a very simple assumption that is the key design of the two models, which is so decisive for the outcomes. And once you have understood this, uh, you can also understand uh, all, the, all the economic debates that uh, have taken place over, over decades and centuries. And in my view, enormous confusion is created in the economics literature because the most econ economists are not really aware of these fundamental differences. They confuse it, they mix it up. And of course, if you mix it up, uh, you will have a terrible confusion. Okay, so far, uh, here we stop. I'm happy we made it through both models. I hope you understood something of it. I hope I wasn't too fast. Um, but uh, we have uh, the tutorial on, on Monday. I think they can also ask questions to Lisa and Thomas. Are there any questions left? Yeah, we have some, uh, some questions left. Um, so in the Keynesian model after the negative demand shock, um, isn't there, um, so there, there's more unemployment after the demand shock, so isn't there more demand for labor um, and therefore the price for labor would decline, which then lead to more money that can be invested by the firms? Very good question. We will answer this question, uh, I think, uh, maybe next week or in two weeks. Uh, it's really very, very decisive point because what, what really is the direct impact in this model is not that the all-purpose good is in excess supply, labor is in excess supply. Now, and the question is there definitely is the real uh, wage, is this a variable if it declines that it can help to get out of this situation? Huh? And um, we will discuss in detail, but I can already right now tell you, in order to get out of this um, short-term equilibrium with unemployment, you need more demand, more consumption or more investment demand. And if you reduce real wages, um, consumption demand presumably will be lower. So the, without going too much into detail, uh, this model, um, in this one, you have to ask yourself, what is the impact on aggregate demand because aggregate demand is a constraint for full employment. And so if you get, want to get out of the situation of, of, uh, of unemployment, you have to stimulate aggregate demand. And the question, key question is, do lower, real, do lower wages increase aggregate demand? And at first sight, you, <laughs> you would make a question mark because if, if you give less, um, wages to the workers, consumption might go down. And so then uh, the, the problem of insufficient aggregate demand gets inverse. But a very good question and we'll discuss it in more detail. Uh, another question is, in the Keynesian model, are higher savings meant as inventory or also as higher monetary savings by families? It's both. So higher inventories, you can define as savings, maybe. Um, but um, one has to, to, to differentiate here between, yes, it, all, it also means higher savings of, of the household sector, of course, yeah. Of course, higher savings of the household sector, yeah. okay. And uh, thinking in a classical model, market-based uh, finance is more efficient because savings are directly used for investments. Is this true? Once again. Is uh, market-based finance more efficient because savings are directly used for investments in a classical model? So you mean a um, market-based finance compared to a bank-based finance? Is that the question? I, that, think, so. I think that's the question. Huh? Yeah. Um, so if if you so so we have this uh, discussion on on financial systems which rely very much on banks, continental European systems, and systems which rely more on the capital market, like uh, in the United States. Um, but uh, to tell you the truth. Household saving is never something that can be used to finance anything. As I already showed you in this very simple example, if Mrs. Smith has more money on her bank account, the companies have less 
money on their bank account. So household saving does not create any additional financial funds. This, so there are no additional funds. And so the question whether financing is made via the capital market or the banking system doesn't, doesn't play a role. But it's a good question and we will go in detail uh, through the uh, implications of these two models uh, for, the, for the financial markets. We talk about bank-based finance and also on, on, on capital market-based finance. Okay, so yeah, thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed it and bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.